Coming up on show 623, electrifying an aerial atom. 8,000 buses for Aussie and question of the week gets answered. Those stories and many more coming up on the programme today. Well, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to EV News Daily. This is the edition for Sunday, 27th of October, as you can hear. I'm sounding much, much better and feeling much better as well. Thank you for the well wishes. Well, thank you as always to myev.com for helping to make this here podcast. They are busy. Uh, They're based in the USA and they are for you. If you're one of my American listeners and you want to get involved in buying and selling used EVs, learning about cars with plug sockets on, let's face it, electric vehicles are better. There's a website dedicated so maybe you get your first one, myv.com. So let's kick off then with a comment from one of my listeners called John. Uh, John says, hey, Martin, you've been talking a lot about how EVs will be more available after January 2020 in Europe. And this seems to be true. All of the people who have ordered an e-tron 50 in Norway have now been told the car has been delayed because of the test date for WLTP being postponed from week 45 to week 49. That now ensures that no e-tron 50s will get delivered until the new year. Probably all to do with CO2 emissions targets, he says. A a move by Audi when there are already Audi e-tron 50s coming off their assembly line and just sitting in storage. Is that true? Anyone who works at Audi, listen to this podcast. You can always get in contact with me in the strictest of confidence and off the record. I'd love to know. Or is there, is it just a genuine reason that for some reason the cars which are now being made and could be with customers aren't going to be there till January 2020? Hey, by the way, a quick 10 second TLDR of the whole situation. There's new emission rules coming in in Europe from January. And if automakers don't sell enough EVs, they'll get big fines. That is a very simplistic way of looking at it. Okay, thank you very much to Lee Brown for becoming an executive producer. Lee, I've added your name to the show notes. And also Charles Fox for becoming a new producer of this show. Thank you, Charles, on Patreon. So we were talking about the Tesla roof, solar glass, as it's now called. And Electrek have obtained an updated Tesla solar roof quote Between versions 2 and version 3, it shows the price of the solar roof tiles have gone down by as much as 40% with the new generation, says Fred at Electrek today. Talking about one of their readers, for a 9.45 kilowatt system on a 1,800 square foot roof, Tesla was charging this website reader $64,000 for the solar roof, along with $10,000 for a power wall. Another 10000 for roof and site repairs. That's a total of $85,000 all in. Well, the homeowner ended up not ordering the system, but they've now updated their quote following the launch of Solar Roof V3 and Solar Glass, and it's now much cheaper. Tesla is now listing the same roof system for 38000 not 64000 a 40% reduction in price. Yes, please. Not that I can get one here, but... I imagine if you're in California, uh, maybe you'll be first, although they're making these things at Giga 2 in in Buffalo. So who knows, maybe all over the US you'll be able to get your solar roof. If you need to replace your roof, it makes every sense to replace it with a system that generates electricity. If you don't need to replace your roof, it would be somewhat uh, folly. However, if it's coming to the end of its life, Maybe you're one of the lucky ones. Elon is talking about a thousand production of being a thousand roofs a week, which I still haven't got my head around because what if if, if what is that? He didn't qualify it. And for someone who is so attention to detail oriented, a nice headline for Elon to say. But what is that? A thousand roofs of a thousand square feet. But what if another roof is two thousand square feet? Well, then you could get only half as much on that. So I don't quite know what production capacity that means, but maybe he was just simplifying things for the expert analysts that he was talking to. Our favourite people. Let's move on. And Borg Warner, a company engaged in electrification on various fronts, has unveiled an interesting new EV demonstration vehicle, and it happens to be a high-voltage buggy. Are you aware of the Aerial Atom? If not... Go on to YouTube immediately after this podcast and have a look at videos of the Aerial Atom. 
just the general, the, the, the company Aerial. Uh, Aerial Nomad is the one that they're changing to EV power. The Aerial no- Nomad is converted to all-electric drive, according to Inside EVs. The Nomad is equipped with two electric motors, an e-gear drive, and a 30-kilowatt-hour battery pack. It really is just a, a frame of a car. You have to wear goggles. You have to wear some sort of protection. But... Goodness me, wouldn't it be amazing to have one of these in your garage as a weekend toy? Electric version? That'd be nice. Borg Warner says that the benefit of the vehicle's electrified powertrain is its improved steering response made possible through torque vectoring. Well, this feature allows both forward motion and regen braking, delivering a a dynamic and controllable driving experience. Another key technology is Borg Warner's thermal management system, which circulates coolant via an electric pump through the inverters and battery pack. The liquid-cooled system is 350 volts nominal, uh, 30 kilowatt hours, peak power of 200 kilowatts on a car that weighs about the same as a roller skate. Moving on, Toyota's Lexus. They're going to launch their first all-electric EV next year. As the luxury brand races to market a battery-operated car amid growing competition from zero emissions vehicles, the head of the brand said on uh, Wednesday earlier this week, according to Reuters, at the unveiling of a concept model of a futuristic EV hatchback at the Tokyo Motor Show, he added that the goal is for sales of Lexus electric vehicles, including battery electrics and gasoline hybrids, to outpace sales of the luxury brand's gasoline vehicle models by 2025. The Tesla Model Y is expected to be the company's highest volume vehicle yet, with Elon Musk noting during the recent uh, third quarter earnings call, he expects the crossover to outsell S3 and X combined. And he would know because he has access to all of the data, all of the initial orders. I think they're talking about a 1.5x, a a one and a half times volume of the Y over the 3. That's the kind of number I think they've, that they've put on it. But of course they would know. They would know because they've got the data. They've got the deposits. Anyway, everybody's favourite former car worker, former GM Bob Lutz. He was the vice chair of, of GM and these days, I'm not sure what he does. Anyway, on the other hand, he has doubts. Lots of doubts, says Simon at Tesla Rati. Uh, Bob Lutz said this, and I quote, The Model 3 continues to sell well, but the Model Y, I think it's terminally ugly. I don't know who's going to buy that. It's another one of those humpback things, like the Model X. It's neither a sport utility nor a sedan, and to the extent that it sells, I don't think it's going to break into a new segment. I think the sales will be largely substitutional to the Model 3. So if ever there was a ringing endorsement that the Model Y will be the most popular car that Tesla has ever made, it's the expert opinion of Bob Lutz saying it will be wildly unpopular. That's a good sign. Final news story today. And, oh, this is interesting. In Australia, the New South Wales government is seeking proposals to shift Sydney's entire bus fleet. This is what we're talking about. Oh, I love an electric bus, me. Uh, This is uh, in the vein of Shenzhen in China, where 16,000 plus buses, public buses, have all gone electric. And it's wonderful to read the press releases from around the world. Uh, California, school bus company might purchase five or a French transit company might purchase eight. In Australia, they're talking about 8,000 going all electric in a landmark decision that marks one of the first tangible policies towards the state's goal of reaching net zero emissions. According to the Driven website, New South Wales Transport Minister Andrew Constance says he will seek new contracts for the supply and operation of Sydney's public bus system, a move that will open the door to electric buses and substantially reduce the environmental footprints of the public transport network. Well, successful electric bus shuttle services have already been in operation at the Sydney and Brisbane airports, which confirm the cost and reliability benefits of EV buses over traditional ones. Uh, Electric buses represent an enormous potential for reducing the environmental footprint of the Australian transport sector. So, that's great news, and I'll pop a link to all those stories on the blog, evnewsdaily.com. 
Righty hope. Let's get on to question of the week this week. Then it was set by one of your fellow listeners asking if you would buy an EV these days that didn't have DC fast charging. So if we're looking at AC charging, if we're looking at uh, Chatamo plug, for instance, uh, which is DC fast charging. But he was talking about CCS, and I, pro- I presume he was ignoring uh, Tesla's proprietary connector in the US. Thank you for your answers. Amongst those, I've picked out the ones from Rajiv Narayan. Uh, Raj says, if the price was right. I would strongly consider buying a car that didn't have CCS and DC fast charging. My Chevy Bolt is two years old, has 61,000 miles on it, and I have not DC fast charged once. Many people may simply need a car to drive around town and don't need it. Sasha says, for frequent long-distance trips, yeah, there's no doubt CCS or superchargers are a must, but I think different people have different needs, and as such, not having CCS and just using AC charging might work for people with houses. If it means getting a vehicle for 10,000, it might be worth it. Uh, When considering resale, it's a different story. However, a car with both AC charging and CCS has more prospective buyers. Hello to Bill Pollock. Now, Bill says, as you likely know, uh, North American domestic electrical service is 110 volts on one pole or 220 volts on two poles. Typically, we run only 30 amps on our 220 volt circuits, but can go as high as 50 amps for hydro applications. Our level two chargers are 40 amps max, so our highest level two charge is about eight kilowatts. That's an overnight charge every time. So no, I will not buy an EV without at least 50 kilowatts of DC fast charging on a CCS plug. John Harkham says, I do not care what charger a car has. On average, people only do one or two long trips a year when they have to charge away from the home charger. The major issue is government should be sorting out uh, with Europe and all the other countries uh, now before massive numbers of EVs are being sold. It, the one standard that everybody should be using is John's take on it. A, uh, a system that can charge at 500 kilowatts that's bi-directional, so you can do vehicle to grid. Japan's Chatamo and China's GBT are joining forces uh, with a new plug for China based on the Chatamo standard, so that might answer all of his wishes. Mark Buckingham says, Hi Martin, Kia ora, Martin. Uh, Even though I have a Kona, yes, just AC charging is fine, depending on the use case. And then he says, more importantly, in three hours' time, England applying the All Blacks in Japan, then... The All Blacks will be in the final, and of course they'll win the World Cup. What's that phrase about things not ageing? Well, you've got to admit, though, if you're listening to me in New Zealand, you've got to admit, England did play very well in the Rugby World Cup semi-finals. That was, okay, so the All Blacks weren't at their best, but it was a good display. Maybe great by the England team, but have they peaked too early? Was that the performance they should have delivered in the final? Delivered a game too early in the semis. Only we will find out this weekend. Rugby World Cup final. Uh, Right. Thank you very much to those who answered the question. Let's set a brand new question of the week for you to email me about. And this is another one set by one of your fellow listeners. And thanks to myev.com. Listener Martin Young asks you this. What were some of your biggest surprises about living with an EV? So it's obviously aimed at people who are EV owners or hybrid owners not those listening to the podcast who are EV curious. So, if you're an EV owner already, let me know the answer to Martin's question, and I'll read out yours on Sunday. What were your biggest surprises about living with an EV? Email me, hello at evnewsdaily.com, or leave a comment on Facebook and YouTube. Yes, there are 258 patrons of the show. Yes, thank you uh, for checking out patreon.com slash evnewsdaily, a premium partner is Phil Roberts of Electric Future and Brad Crosby and Avid Technology and a fourth name to add to the list soon I can say no more it's a name close to my heart I'll say no more Uh, uh, hello to my partners David Allen thank you David OEM Audio of New Zealand and evpower.co.nz cheering on the old blacks Uh, also Paul O'Connor tryev.com Gareth Hamer e-mobility in norway and we must get them on the podcast check them out emobilitynorway.com if you want to find out about what they are doing 
and all my exec producers as well. Alan Robson, Alan Shedd, Alex Banahini, Alexander Frank, Anders Hove, Ashley Hill, Bjorn Fuchstack, Barry Peniston, Brent Kingsford, Brian Thompson, Brian Weatherall, says Archer Hillo, Charles Hall, Chris Hopkins, Colin Hennessy, Craig Coles, Craig Cooper, Craig Rogers, Damian Davis, Dan Fairs, Darren Bird, Darren Sant, Yorkshire EVs, Dave Jukeson, David Barkman, David Finch, David Partington, David Prescott, Derek Riley from TheEffect.net, and Dirk Rodsatz. Hello, Don McAllister from ScreencastsOnline.com, Enrico, Stefan Schillo, Frederick Rovick, Free Jewel, aka James, Gene Rubin, Jeff Lowe, George Clargo, Ian Griffiths, Ian Steer, Jack Oakley, James Storr, Jeff Erbys, Jerry Allison, Jill Smith, Jim Morris, John Bailey, John Lacey from Click Clack Video NZ, John who is Beardy McBeardface, Kent EVs, John Nodell, Juan Gonzalez, Ken Morris, Kevin Madison, Carl Mann, Lars Dallager, Lawrence D. Allen, Lejek Grigil, Lee Brown, Newbie, Luke Cully, Marcel Lohman, Marcel Ward, Marlin Shell, Martin Croft, Matt Piscioni, Matthew Ellis, Maz Shah, Mia Opelstrup, Michael Pastroni, Michael Cuffin, Mike Rogers, Mike Winter, Nathan Gore Brown, Neil Lee Roberts, Sussex EVs, Northern Explorers, O'Had Aston, Paul Ridings, Paul Seeger Smith, Paul Shelley, and Paul Stevenson. Perry Simpkins, Pete Glass, Pete Gorton, Peter and D. Roberts, Oxen EVs, Phil Mouchet, Pontus Klingbed, Ralph Jensen, Renee Schneider, Rob Cooling from AppleDriving.co.uk, Rob Hermans, Robert Grace, Robert uh, Mitchell, Robin Tanner, Sabby the Cat, Sarah McCann, Sarah Kangas, Lodger, Sakey Payne, Steve John, Stuart Hannah, The Limousine Lion in Sydney, The Plug Seekers, EV YouTube channel, Tim Gusseridge, William Langhorn, and Zach Hurst. And breathe. 622 previous shows online, something like that. And if you want to get the archive, you can do. Uh, they're all for free. Like the new shows, you get them first and free and automatically by hitting subscribe in your podcast app. Have a wonderful day. I'll catch you soon. And do remember, there's no such thing as a self-charging hybrid. <laughs>